D.E. Recording Alert. My name is James Nagel. Welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. After four months of siege, Major General Charles Townsend of the Indian Army's 6th Division surrendered the town of Kut to Ottoman forces on the 29th of April 1916. While Townsend and his men were marched into captivity, the British relief forces, which had failed to break through the Ottoman line, were withdrawn to a position 12 miles away to rest. In their ranks was a young artillery bombardier by the name of Tom Barry. Here, Barry says he read of a war communique titled Rebellion in Dublin, referencing the shelling of the General Post Office and the execution of rebel leaders a few weeks beforehand. On the 26th of May, he was demoted to the rank of gunner at his own request, which he would later claim was in protest at the British Army's actions in Ireland, and he served in a number of fronts for the rest of the war, returning home to Cork in February of 1919. Having previously known little to nothing of Irish history, Barry says in his autobiography that he now began to read avidly on the topic, on Wolf Tone, on the famine, and newspaper reports on the 1916 Rising. The words of the proclamation enthralled him, and in the middle of the year he approached Sean Buckley, the intelligence officer of the Bandon Battalion, asking to join the IRA. However, historian Jerry White has also shown that Barry was trying to gain employment at this time in the British Civil Service. He was a member of the Bandon branch of an ex-soldiers union, which he addressed in November of 1919, proposing that the government remove civilians who hadn't served in the war from the civil service and give their jobs over to the discharged and the demobilised. He failed an entrance exam for the Irish Division of the Ministry of Labour, and in February of 1920 he asked for a government posting to India. By August of 1920, the Auxiliaries and the Essex Regiment had driven the IRA in Cork on the run and captured a number of their principal officers. The Lord Mayor and officer commanding the No. 1 Brigade, Terence McSweeney, was sentenced to two years in prison, while Tom Hales, officer commanding the No. 3 Brigade, was also incarcerated for the duration of the War of Independence. If British forces were to be stopped, the IRA, made up of farmers' sons and unskilled labourers, would need to be trained, and an approach was made to Tom Barry. While he was initially reluctant to take the position, wishing instead to finish studies he had undertaken and try to get a job, Barry was appointed to the staff of the West Cork Brigade as a training officer. He proposed a massive overhaul of training methods by holding a series of intense week-long camps culminating in an ambush on British forces. In September, IRA General Headquarters issued a nationwide directive that brigades should set up flying columns. Barry was appointed to command the one established in West Cork, and it saw action for the first time at Turin on the 22nd of October. More than 30 men lay in wait for a convoy of the Essex Regiment, and the intention was to stop the lead lorry with a landmine buried in the road. This failed to detonate, however, and the first lorry sped away, but the second was stopped with gunfire. Their commander, Lieutenant William Dixon, and another soldier were killed before they surrendered. Of the five wounded, another would die the following day. This was the first major defeat the Essex Regiment had suffered, but the main threat to the IRA remained C Company of the Auxiliaries, based at McCroom Castle since August. By the start of November 1920, only one auxiliary had died in Ireland, shot accidentally during weapons training at Beggar's Bush, and no attack had been carried out against them, though they had scored a number of major victories over the IRA. On the 21st of November, which would become known as Bloody Sunday for the scenes of chaos that played out in Dublin, Barry assembled 36 men for a training camp northwest of Dunmanway. He described it as a new force, only one of them had been at Turin, and only three had gone through a training camp previously. After just seven days of drill, often interrupted by the need to escape approaching army patrols, they would take on a platoon of battle-hardened war veterans and strike the first blow against the auxiliaries in Ireland. At three o'clock in the morning of the 28th of November, the men were given confession and marched in lashing rain to the ambush site at Kilmichael. Barry described it as follows. The ambush area was in the centre of a bleak and barren countryside, a bogland interspersed with heather and rocks. Here the north-south road surprisingly turned west-east for 150 yards and then resumed its north-south direction. There were no ditches on either side of the road, but a number of scattered rocky eminences of varying sizes. 
No house was visible except one, 150 yards south of the road at the western entrance to the position. It was on this stretch of road it was hoped to attack the auxiliaries. Number 1 section, consisting of 10 riflemen, was placed on the back slope of a large heather-covered rock, and number 2 section was placed 150 yards away, allowing them to fire on the second lorry in the convoy if it hadn't yet come around the bend when the ambush started. Number 3 section was split in two. Six men under the section commander occupied a chain of rocks 50 yards south of the road to prevent the auxiliaries securing a fighting position there, while the remaining six men were placed further north in the event that the convoy was larger than expected and to block any attempt by the auxiliaries to retreat. One unarmed scout was placed to warn of any unexpected forces coming from Dunmanway, and two unarmed scouts were placed to signal the approach of the auxiliary convoy. For eight hours, the men held their positions, and as Barry was preparing to abandon the ambush at 4pm as it was getting dark, the signal was given that a convoy of two Crossley tenders were approaching. Barry had given great thought to the problem of stopping the convoy following the failure of the landmine to explode at Turin. As the first lorry drove through the kill zone, Barry stepped forward from his command post behind a low stone wall wearing a volunteer's uniform. As he had hoped, the driver mistook him for a British officer, or was at least so confused that he slowed down, giving Barry time to lob a grenade into the open cab. The explosion, which killed the driver instantly, served as the signal to begin the attack. Number 1 section moved into position at the top of the rock and fired down on the vehicle which had ground to a halt before them as the auxiliaries tried to dismount. Within five minutes, all nine occupants were either dead or mortally wounded. On realising that they were under attack, the driver of the second lorry had tried to reverse but had become stuck. The auxiliaries were able to use the Crossley tender as cover and were putting up a solid fight against number 2 section as Barry and his command post advanced along the road towards them. Barry says that he heard the auxiliaries surrender, but as three men from number 2 section stood up, they were shot. Barry and the command post opened fire on the rear of the auxiliaries and when they realised that they were surrounded, they attempted to surrender again. Barry ordered that no quarter be given. Having seen more than enough of their surrender tactics, I shouted the order, Keep firing on them. Keep firing number two section. Everybody keep on firing until the ceasefire. Then the ceasefire was given, and there was an uncanny silence as the sound of the last shot died away. Two IRA men had been killed during the false surrender and one mortally wounded. Of the 18 auxiliaries that drove into the ambush, 16 of them were dead. The driver of the second lorry had escaped and headed to McCroom to raise the alarm, but was captured by the IRA later that evening and executed with his own weapon. When a recovery party was sent out the following day, they found only a single survivor, barely clinging to life. But here the narrative becomes confused. The autopsy on the dead showed that three of them had bullet wounds to their armpits, indicating that they were shot with their hands over their heads and others had wounds which were inflicted after death. Many who had been involved at Kilmichael disagreed with Barry's depiction when his memoirs were serialised in the Irish press in 1948, and he was outraged by an account published in 1973. It made no mention of the false surrender by auxiliary forces and indicated that the three IRA casualties had been killed or wounded in the initial exchange of fire before Barry's advance. The controversy soon died down, and as Barry's Guerrilla Days in Ireland became one of the most well-read accounts of the War of Independence, his version of the Kilmichael ambush went unchallenged. That is, until the late 1990s, when Canadian historian Peter Hart reworked his doctoral thesis, The IRA and Its Enemies, for publication. Hart rejected Barry's account that the auxiliaries had engaged in a false surrender, and instead claimed that Barry had ordered their executions after they were taken prisoner. His assertion was based on a number of interviews he had conducted with men who had taken part in the ambush, including one with an anonymous scout on the 19th of November 1989. The only problem was that the last known scout present at Kilmichael had passed away six days before that date. Hart refused to give the name of his source, leading to accusations that he had fabricated the interview, and jokes 
that he was communing with the dead. Hart passed away in 2010, but the controversy caused by his work continued. A battle was waged in the leather section of history Ireland and the Southern Star by those critical of his research methods and perceived political bias, and those who defended him. One of those, Eve Morrison, examined Hart's papers and came to the conclusion that the mystery scout was Willie Chambers, a recipient of the military service pension who had always claimed to be at Kilmichael. But Chambers is placed 10 miles away from the ambush and detractors say that he couldn't possibly know what occurred there. Agonizingly, his pension application, which might give us some clue as to what he told Hart if he was the anonymous interviewee, has not yet been released by the military archives as of the making of this episode. While we may never know the true story of what happened at Kilmichael, it is clear that it did not happen as depicted by Tom Barry, and his account is contradicted by numerous statements given to the Bureau of Military History by those who took part. None of them mention a false surrender, but they do reference a whistle blast given by Barry as an order to advance from behind cover, and, as he was approaching from the rear and in the growing dark, uncertain of what was actually happening, there was a clear opportunity for a misunderstanding of the situation. One interpretation is that Barry blew his whistle at the first calls of surrender from the auxiliaries, while others were still firing, resulting in two of his men being wounded as they stood up. Barry may have been trained by the British Army, but he had served as an artillery gunner, and was as new to the concepts of guerrilla war as were the men under him. William H. Cout, a professor of military history at the United States Army Command and General Staff College, has described some of Barry's decisions at Kilmichael as puzzling, saying, The division of Section 3 into North and South subsections was dangerous, as they could easily have fired on each other in the confusion of battle and the descending darkness. The positioning of the command post to the easternmost part of the battle area was also unusual, since it did not afford Barry the ability to see his three sections, or the full auxiliary forces, in the kill zone. While the debate as to what actually happened at Kilmichael will continue for some time, likely never to be fully answered, there can be no debate around the impact of the ambush. The auxiliaries were an elite core of World War I veterans, seen by some as predecessors to modern special forces units. They had known nothing but success since their arrival in Ireland, and authorities felt confident that the IRA would be crushed by Christmas. Following just a week after Bloody Sunday, the ambush reaffirmed the IRA's ability to successfully carry out large attacks and force the British government to introduce martial law in all of Munster by January, out of step with their claim that what was happening in Ireland was a simple policing operation. Cout has said Kilmichael indicated that IRA ambush doctrine, though not yet fully mature, was improving. The IRA, and Tom Barry in particular, would be given plenty of opportunities to improve throughout early 1921, as the British remained stubbornly committed to enforcing a military victory, having taken Republican willingness to discuss peace terms in December as a sign of weakness. After almost two years of fighting, the bloodiest phase of the War of Independence lay ahead. Ahorda, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slongafol.